All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So today I'll be talking about turbo codes, which are kind of just an interesting uh, way of tying together some of the things that we've been covering this semester. They're used in the real world for things like cellular communication. So this is like an actual thing. And they also bring together some interesting CS stuff. We'll do a little bit of the probability, a little bit of DP, and then arrive at turbo codes. So one approach that is semi-commonly used is if we have some code, which we'll call code A, we might make a new code by just running code B on the output of code A and then transmitting this across the wire, essentially just some kind of nested code. But one of the disadvantages we might see with a code like this is it doesn't really give us any advantage when errors are kind of bursty. It's just because we have two codes doesn't mean that the burst is going to not be bursty anymore. So we want some way to kind of get something better in bursty environments and also just have better performance. So the first thing that we'll take a look at before we get to turbo codes will be convolutional codes which are just a sliding window, essentially. So if we have some binary string, let's say 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, we can consider a window of bits on the string. I'll consider a window of size 3. And we want to, for this convolutional code, we aren't going to actually transmit any of the bits of the original string, we are only going to transmit parity bits. And our goal will be to use these parity bits so that we can recover the original string or what we think is most likely to be the original string. And the way we'll define this is we create multiple parity bits per uh, binary digit. So for example, P1 of N, is the, or sorry, that should be P1 of one, is the, par is the first parity bit corresponding to this first zero. And P2 of one would be the second parity bit corresponding to this first zero. So we'll transmit two parity bits per digit in this string as just a simple example. And to make things easier, we're going to imagine that we have two zeros to the left in negative indices so that we don't have to handle special cases. And we define PI as what well, is basically a convolution. So we say it is the sum going from J equals zero to whatever our window length is minus one. So I'm gonna call that window length capital K. And now I have this GI, which I'll explain in a second. And then we're going to multiply this with our input at index N minus J. And GI is what we call a generator polynomial. And we can think of GI as being just some kind of like a uh, three tuple. So GI might look something like one, one, zero. And that specifies how we're going to include or exclude the pieces of A in the sum. And this is a sum that is mod two. So this is a base two sum. So we can think of this as we look at uh, GI zero times a n x or GI one times a n minus one x or GI two times a n minus two. So does this idea of generator polynomials to build these parity bits make sense? Okay, so. We can view this transmission, and this is also why we need the two zeros to the left, right? Because we start with like two zeros to our left. 
And we can view this uh, generating these parity bits as being a state machine. So, oops. oops. Our state machine looks something like this, where we start in the state where we would be emitting two zeros and then we, so the current state is like the past two characters. And then based on our generator polynomials, we can construct this DFA where it says, when we see a one, we would emit one one, for example, based on the generator polynomials. Or if we just had one zero as our past two digits and we see a one, then we would emit zero zero based on the generator based on our polynomials. And our goal, so we are now, we now want some hardware that will take the, the sequence of parity bits and uh, transfer it to our receiver where we can then figure out some decoding. So a brief aside on how this happens, which we'll see why it's important later, is we can think of at a very basic level, the hardware that is emitting these bits that our uh, DFA is generating has two parts. We have some kind of just consistent signal that looks like this, and then which I'll call the carrier. And then we have a sequence of binary digits that might look something like this ones and zeros. And what we do is we take this carrier frequency, which is some kind of sine wave, and we modulate it using the binary. So a simple way to think about this would be if you have some kind of, uh, you have your carrier, and then you have your binary, then you put in some kind, you put a multiplier in here, feed them both into the multiplier and feed this out. And if your binary is uh, instead of ones and zeros is plus one minus one for like voltages, then what this corresponds to is your every time you go low, you're flipping the sine wave. And this allows a receiver to detect when these changes happen and make an educated guess at what kind of data it's receiving, whether it's a one or a zero. And this is not exact. So we will assume that our receiver can give us two things. It can either give us a hard decision, which would be uh, just, it is, it just tells us it is one or it is zero, or it can do a soft decision. And that is equivalent to telling us that it is one with some likelihood. And we might want to use that likelihood when we are trying to reconstruct what the original input string was. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so now what we want to do is we'll first begin with the hard decision case. And we want to figure out some way to decode the sequence of ones and zeros corresponding to the parity bits that we received from our source. And essentially what that means is we want to find the maximum likelihood sequence of state transitions in the state machine, because we might have received some kind of corrupted string that couldn't have been created by any sequence of state transitions in this DFA. So we want to figure out what is the most likely uh, sequence of state transitions to generate the string we found. And there's a little bit of math involved in this. So the first thing we're going to do is 
we're going to assume that uh, the probability P of bit errors is less than one half. That'll, if it's more than one half, then things get strange and you're kind of, if it's more than one half, then you should reconsider whether turbo codes are the right thing to use. So we'll assume like less than half probability of bit errors. And now we want to solve a maximization problem. We want to maximize probability of R given C, where R is uh, what we got and C is some code word. So we want to figure out the map, the C that maximizes the probability of what we received if that was the actual code word. So we'll consider um, some test code word, we'll call it C tilde, with a Hamming distance of D from R. So if you aren't familiar, Hamming distance is just how many ones or zeros do I need to flip to turn uh, a Hamming distance D, that shouldn't say of, that should say from. Uh, so how many ones do I, or in zeros do I need to flip in C tilde to get to R? And if we uh, know this Hamming distance and we know our probability of bit errors, we can derive a, an expression for probability of R given C tilde as being equal to this expression here. So we just take a look at how many bits are off and then our probability that those are wrong. And once we have this probability, we can do like a standard probability trick and we can take the log of it. So log of this would be equal to D log P plus N minus D times log one minus P plus D log uh, P over one minus P plus N log one minus P, kind of an ugly expression. But what this means is we know that our P is less than or equal to one half. And that tells us that this expression here is going to be less than one. And so log P over one minus P is going to be a negative value. So uh, this, oops, uh, so log times of P of R given C tilde is minimized. by minimizing D. So in other words, what we've shown is that the maximum likelihood code word is the one that has the smallest Hamming distance to what we, to what we receive. So we want to figure out then, we've reduced this problem to finding a sequence of state transitions to minimize D because we can assume we know what the sender states are as the receiver. So does this make sense? Any questions on what we have so far? Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of expansion, so we should have four, I believe. Uh, let me... Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
those are equal. That's my bad. I was like, yeah. I was like, am I missing a lot of properties? Okay. No. no, I am missing my equal signs. Yeah. So thank you, catch. Thank you. So yeah, with that, it's yeah, just minimize D. So now we want to consider <coughs> another diagram here, which is called like a trellis diagram usually. And we can view this, we have this kind of table format here and XN is the like the decoded kind of what we think we received. So we know we always start in the upper left corner of the trellis because that is always the first state, right? We always start by assuming that there are no zeros, that the like the negative indices are all zeros. And then as we receive bits, we want to map some kind of path through the trellis. And the first thing we'll do is for each of these branches on our trellis, we're going to define what's called a branch metric. And this is the, so each arc corresponds to the parity bits that we're kind of receiving. So we want to say that our branch metric of some branch is the hemming distance from the branch to the actual receive. And this is defined per arc in this graph and there are uh, a lot of arcs. There's like exponentially many of them. So when we see exponents, dynamic programming is a useful thing. What do you mean by arc? Uh, edge. Okay. And then, so what we want to do is find a, an optimal path through this graph, right? And what we'll say is that first we want to make some observation, which is that if we look, if we construct our generators correctly, in a DFA like this, for every state, there are two incoming edges, no more, no less. So for every node in this trellis slash graph, it has exactly two incoming edges. And we know a priori what those edges are going to be for every node in the trellis. So I'm going to, just for convenience, let alpha and beta be our, like our legal previous vertices. And then we want to define a value for each uh, node in this trellis, which we'll call the path metric. And the path metric is going to be our hamming distance essentially. So we'll say that the path metric, so when we are getting to a new layer in our trellis, we perceived two bits. We're going to take the minimum over oops, all possible start states that we could have gone to before getting to this uh, current state. And we have two options, or so we have these two options, alpha and beta, and the hamming distance incurred would be whatever hamming distance we had at the previous state plus the hamming distance uh, given by the branch metric on this edge from X to S. So this gives us a path through the trellis that has the smallest possible hamming distance. So therefore, PM uh, SN gives the best, um, 
like approximation of the path for um, to for reconstructing the code word. <laughs> And since we have this recurrence, this is just DP. We can evaluate this iteratively as we keep getting more data. And then we can work back and figure out what the path should be. So like the modeling of best approximate path look like the above picture or a little lost? It is the one in red. Uh, it's in this okay, picture. Okay, so, so like the recurrence tells me if I know where the best place is to start in one layer, like you figure out where to go in the next layer in the red. Right. Uh, yeah, that's and tracing that path back corresponds to to D there should be a zero or a one at the top. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And that's because we only rely on the pa the <coughs> past two digits. So we're able to do this navigation back. Yeah. Yes. Or so oh, this should be uh, at like the previous layer. Uh, there's yeah, so this indicates there's a legal transition from X to S. And then we want to look at this has some bits associated with this transition. So what is the Hamming distance of those bits compared to the bits that I receive? So to get from say state X to state S, that corresponds to, if I go up to this picture and call this X and this S, Going from X to S entails I read a one and emitted zero zero. Yes, the branch metric relies on the zero zeros. Okay, so now I won't go into the details because the recurrence is pretty ugly, but we can also modify this to account for the likelihoods given by like a soft decision hardware. And then the idea that like you, we want to maybe use these likelihoods in a more intelligent way to use like past data to inform future decisions when we're doing decoding. So that's kind of the idea of turbo codes. It's not because they're fast. It's based on car engines, is how they named them. So what we'll take a look at is first, let's do a slight review of like how we estimate things. So we'll all, put down Bayes theorem expressed in a way that will be useful to us for turbo codes. So we're going to say that probability of, I'll explain what all these variables are. So D is, so this D equals I says some data bit we got uh, belongs to the IF signal class. So in our case, that would just be zero or one. And then uh, X is some kind of signal noise measurement that our hardware gives us. And we won't get into details on 
how hardware does this because that's a whole nother talk. And we can write this as a kind of long expression here. And I'll explain what all of these terms are. So we write uh, P of X as being a sum. Uh, it goes from one to M. And this P, this is a PDF. So with this, we want to kind of use this idea to say, okay, given X, which is some kind of noise measurement or other data, we want to uh, find like the maximum likelihood choice of uh, D. So if we were to draw this out, we might have something that looks a little bit like this. So this would be I'm drawing the probabilities of noise, which we'll assume is just normally distributed. And we have, and the maximum likelihood rule for deciding like which bit we're going to take would be to say something like, if I got some signal that is here, I'm going to, maybe that's kind of a bad place. Uh, let me pick right here. So if I got some, bit or of data that has this voltage. I'm going to look at this intercept and this intercept, and this one is greater. So we know that we have this property. So we want to somehow use this idea of like likelihood estimation to improve our decoding. And then there's one other uh, kind of estimation, which you might remember from uh, 361 if you've taken it, which is map estimation, which is where we have, we want to check if the probability that is greater than probability it is minus one given the current noise. So the we want to check like which of these is greater, right? Because if the probability that it's one is greater than the probability that it's negative one, then we'll pick one, else we would pick zero, right? And we have these expressions up here that use Bayes' theorem to give us the probability of the bit being something given some kind of noise measurement. So if we simplify that out all the way, I'll skip the math since I'm running just a tad bit over time, we'll get to probability that D equals plus one times The, prob the signal noise given D equals one over the probability D equals minus one and if it's greater than one we pick plus one else we say that it is zero. This is just from expanding out the Bayes theorem and moving fractions around. And with this in mind, we'll make, now we have, we can kind of start making some assumptions. And our first assumption will be that ones and zeros, or alternatively ones and negative ones are equally likely, at least to start. We can always adjust this ratio later, but it makes sense that at first, like if this is some wireless network, 
it's not any more likely that you're getting a bunch of ones or a bunch of zeros. So now we have this term and we're going to do standard trick with it, which is to take the log and the log of this is the log of the ratio of these probabilities. plus the log of the ratio of these two PDFs. And I'll write this as is on the other side. So I'll write this as like the likelihood of D plus the likelihood of x given d. And now our hardware we can think of as being kind of this magical box that we won't describe too much that takes in two inputs. The first one is L of d and it outputs some new estimate of L of d and it takes in what we call a channel measurement. So the channel measurement is what kind of signal it's receiving, the actual like wave. And then we combine our channel measurement and our um, likelihood of it being a zero or a one to output some estimate of what that bit actually is. So now we want to use this idea to actually build up some kind of encoder or decoder. So we'll use a slight modification of the convolutional codes discussed earlier, which are called recursive uh, convolutional codes. So we'll say that we'll first it's easiest to explain these with the diagram. So we have some data bit and we're going to output a couple things. We'll output. So this is an exclusive or here and we've got AI, AI minus one and AI minus two. And these are all updated like one after the other and are used to initialize the next bit. So we have a three-way sum just like we had before, except this time it uses the past two values in creating this new value of AI. And then based on our generator polynomials, we somehow combine these three AIs to form another output. So in our case, that might be something like, I'm going to take AI and AI minus two, XOR them together and output some other bit. So now we're outputting two bits of information from this encoder and we can kind of modify the recurrence previously to actually decode this. But that's not the kind of the interesting part here. The interesting part is uh, how would we um, extend this to deal with burstiness, which is like, and then how would we develop a decoding strategy that deals with uh, updating in response to like the, the measurements from this magical hardware box. So the first thing we'll do is we'll add a box here, which is an interleaver. So we interleave all the bits of our data together. And in parallel, we're going to do the same thing as above. 
it can even be the same code and this will output some VK. And now we're outputting three things. We're outputting uh, UK and two VKs. And if we're clever, we can uh, multiplex these VKs together so that we don't harm our rate. But for simplicity, we'll just assume that this is like a rate one third code. And now we want to develop some decoder for this box that I've drawn here. And, oh, I was going to run chat, oh well. Um, so our decoder will take in, we have some UK, and then we initially have a decoder one for our kind of non-interleaved uh, systematic uh, recursive code. And we have here our DMUX. So this takes in the signal that contains both V1 and V2 and splits it out into V1 and V2. So we'll send V1 into D1. So now D1 is attempting to decode our output from this top area. But we also modify D1. We'll add some more input to D1 later so that D1 is actually using the likelihood information. And now we have an interleaver. And we'll go to a decoder, D2. And D2 takes in some kind of interleaved, right? Because remember, D1 takes in the non-interleaved raw data, which is UK. And now uh, D2 takes in the interleaved raw data. So we pass it in the interleaved raw data as well as our V2. And now D2 can, using the standard procedure of finding the max likelihood path, it can give us two things. It can give us both the uh, path itself and some kind of likelihood estimate. So we can feed that likelihood estimate back into D1 so that D1 can use it when decoding the next bit. And then we'll also output our decoded bit. And this way we're kind of using this feedback of what we learn about likelihood, whether it's through signal noise or whatever, back into our decoder so that we can get better results. And there's a lot of math to go into like proofs for this, but the TLDR is we get a 10 to the negative five uh, bit error probability. Assuming just like caution uh, noise on our signals, which is pretty decent for a relatively simple code that you can implement in hardware easily. So that's why this is used for things like cell networks because it's really cheap to do and works pretty well. So uh, that's all I have for turbo codes, but uh, any questions?